Hello and welcome to our March virtual tasting. I'm your host, Madeline Schmoll, and I'm going to talk you through the whiskies. Uh, but before we get started, I wanted to talk about this month's theme a bit. So this month has been all about whiskey game changers from our own founder, Pip Hills, through to a rout of industry innovators who constantly push the boundaries of what's possible in whiskey. Tonight's whiskies are all about new taste and flavor experiences from lesser known distilleries. We'll talk a bit more about that in just a minute, uh, but I want to do some housekeeping first. All five bottlings for tonight's tastings are available via the link sent to you by member services. For those of you tuning in from the EU, we've kept bottlings aside for the to be rescheduled March tastings. In terms of uh, availability, cask number 44.139 Kiss Me You Fool has an extremely low outturn. Um, so if you know you want this bottling, please don't hesitate. It's one per member and there's only 14 available. Uh, so if you know you want it, go for it. In terms of our running order for the evening, uh, we will start with 6.46 white poached pears, followed by 73.120 Scottish Sugar Rush. Then we'll go to 35.279, greeted with a big smile and open arms, followed by 44.139, kiss me you fool, and 128.13, Welsh cobbler sherry cocktail. So this is the point in the evening to make sure that you have your tasting mat ready. If you've chosen to use any of our food or beer pairings for tonight, let us know in the comments. Finally, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to comment and we can take it from there. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to your ambassadors for the evening. So first off, we have our global brand ambassador, John McShane. Hi, folks. Hey, John, how you doing? I'm doing fine, Matt. How are you? Yeah, I'm all right. It's a good night for a tasting. <laughs> yeah. We also have Les Harrow joining us. Good evening from Harrogate. Evening all. Evening, Matt. Hello. Evening, John. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing not too bad, thank you very much. Great to have you. And last but not least, we've got our special guest for the evening, Global Brand Ambassador David Cover from Pandaren Distillery. Hey, David, how you doing? Hi, yeah, no, I'm doing really good. Doing really good. How's everyone doing? Hi, very well. Great. Yeah, looking forward to a great tasting this evening. <laughs> Indeed. Well, I think, John, you were going to kick us off with a bit about uh, about these whiskey game changers. Yeah, yeah. Well, you mentioned you mentioned Pip Mads, and I think it's um we we've actually got an audience tonight that comes from all over these home countries and Europe, and it's just fantastic to be able to say that in our thirty eighth year. When Pip Hills started off the society in nineteen eighty three, some people thought he was mad, including his own accountant and his own solicitor. It was a bad time for Scotch whisky. There were distilleries closing all over the place. We were in a recession. And here was this madman going to start up a single cast, single malt business. And he admits he nearly went bankrupt twice. Here we are today in 25 countries around the world with 30,000 members. And Pip not only drove the society, Pip drove a renaissance and uh, the appreciation of single malt whiskey, especially single cast single malt whiskey, it was almost unheard of back then. So in many, many ways, you could say that Pip changed the game entirely. I was actually with Pip in Denmark uh, in January of last year before it all went, all, all, all went into lockdown. And they just, they, just, they just love him abroad as well because he is actually... He loves the society and the current ethos because he thinks it does reflect what he tried to start off all those years ago. He thinks we've stayed true to that ethos. And a couple of years ago, we actually had a tasting in the vault by Pip. And in the archive, we, we, we broke open a bottle of 1.1. I was lucky enough to be there. It was fantastic. So what a celebration of Pip as our founder. And that evening, people came from everywhere for that tasting. I've got a good member in Moscow who flew to Edinburgh just for that, just to taste one dot one, and flew back home again the following day. But it's all down to Pip and that uh, that syndicate he had around them back then, and the tasting panels. And what 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 a game changer that man has been. Yeah, and I would recommend to anyone uh, who hasn't read it yet 
um, to check out The Founder's Tale, which is yes. how Pip got going yes. with the society. And uh, I believe you can buy it from our website. Um, and it's a really, it's a, it's an, a very entertaining read and lots of uh, good escapism there and, and good good with the drama as well. That's right. Anybody who wants to know about this, the early days of the society, that's the book to read. Fantastic. Absolutely. Well, I think we are uh, just about ready uh, to kick off with the first dram, if, if you are, John. Sure, of course I am, yes. Now, so, yes, the first, first of all, let, let me just say that um, Mad has told you about some of the whiskies we're going to be uh, looking at tonight in terms of game-changing, maybe lesser-known distilleries. And, uh, and but we, main, we, we now do whiskies from all around the world. But mainly, we're still doing. So we still do Scotch. Scotch is our mainstay, and Scotland and Scotch are intertwined over hundreds of years. As uh, whiskey's part of our culture, so last week was International Women's Week. So I'm going to give you a couple. Of, I'm going to give you a quote, and Les is going to give you a quote from a couple of important women in the Scotch whiskey industry about how important it is. And my quote is from. Rachel McNeil from Isla, who runs the Isla Whiskey Academy. And Rachel says, the context for whiskey drinking is an awareness and a connection to the land, place, people, culture, weather, emotion, and a myriad other elements coming together in the creation of our golden elixir. Rachel talks about the kinship of whiskey drinking, and no one knows better than Rachel, I can assure you. You've got another quote as well, Les. I do have John. And it's from another very, very famous uh, lady in the, the whiskey industry, Rachel Barry, who I'm sure many of you will have heard her name. She's a master blender for Glendonic, Ben Rhea, and Glengasau. At the moment, she's been around quite a few other distilleries in Scotland, building a name and a reputation for herself. And she creates some wonderful, wonderful whiskies. And the quote from uh, Rachel was, the diverse character of Scotch single malt encapsulating the elemental body, soul and passion of our nation on its, uh, on its diverse, exceptional and unique offerings. And uh, hopefully you're going to sample some unique offerings tonight. Uh, only four from Scotland, of course, because the last one is from uh, our other Celtic cousins in Wales. I'm about to say that, you know, although we although we love our Scotland and Scotch tonight, we are delighted to have another whisky from another historic land as part of our home countries here. I was actually doing a little bit of reading about Wales, David, and I it turns out that you you're the country with more castles than any other country. How did that happen? Absolutely, absolutely. I, yeah. I, I, probably, I, probably I, to fend off the English. I think actually it was the other way around that the English built a lot of castles to uh, yeah, to keep, yeah, probably, to keep the Welsh in uh, yeah, in hand. Yeah. But let me tell you, folks. I hope there's a few Welsh people on board because I was talking to a few Welsh people who are good members and friends of mine through the week, and Wales has got the longest place name in the world. <laughs> and it's shortened to Landfair PG. But I'm going to read the whole name for you tonight. It's Landfair Pul Gwyn Gilgoger I Chwarndrob Il T Silio Gogogoch. That was fantastic. That was well, great. Well. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably nothing like it, but it's good fun anyway. Much anyway. better than I could do. <laughs> <laughs> Whiskey number one. Now, this is from a distillery in. Uh, the Highlands of Scotland, and it's, a, it's separated across the River Deverin from Banff by a seven-arch stone bridge, and it was only built in 1962, and it's probably thankful for that, because in 1941, Banff Distillery, no, I said the river, was bombed. Uh, during the war, and the liquid all spilled across the land, and they had drunken cows and sheep for weeks, apparently. And even one fireman filled his helmet with the whiskey from Banff and got arrested for it. So there you are. But Macduff was built in 1962, and it was a game changer in its day. It was the first distillery, really, to have uh, 
shelling tube condensers, no maltings in the plant. So it really was a new idea in its day. And this 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 whiskey is would be eleven years old. It was distilled the 29th of January 2009 and matured its for its whole life for a second fill ex bourbon barrel. We've given it a spicy and sweet flavour profile. So let's see what you think. It's also the main whiskey that you'll find in William Lawson Blend. The William Lawson Blend is not so well known these days, particularly in this country, but it's a big, big seller in a country like Russia, for example. And this is the mainstay malt for that particular blend. The new, the new make spirit here, this distillery, tends to be malty and nutty. Some say it's lighter than that and grassy, but in the in the maturation with the bourbon barrel, I think we've actually I've, I'm actually getting like a spring, a summer breeze coming through here with juicy earthy pears, even a touch of dry white wine, braised fruit, touch of cinnamon on the nose. So, let, so please, everybody, let us hear where you're from. Let us know where you're from if you're listening in. Any questions, feel free, unless of a bit of banter as we go along. Absolutely. Well, I would just like to say that uh, also, Andy Garth we're, we're, is, we're going to try with pairing tonight, and Mads has come up with a terrific pairing for this whiskey. Yes, thank you, John. Um, I was just going to say, I, I noticed there it's Andy Horace's first tasting with us, so welcome, Andy, and we hope you enjoy. Um, and there, there's lots of others. We've got folk tuning in from all over, from Flanders, um, and from, from Switzerland and from Germany. It's great to have all of you. Um, in terms of the pace, uh, pasting, I'm tasting and <laughs> pairing for this dram. Um, I, I had a bit of fun with it, actually. Um, I think one of the, the best ways to approach pairing food and whiskey is to try the drams and then pick some things that you think might work with it and then just sit down at the table with, you, with your other half or with friends and, and try it. Um, and so that's what I did with this dram, and we came up with pairing of a, a Lotus Biscoff biscuit followed by a, uh, a Milky Bar button. So my recommendation, if you have this pairing, is to take a sip of the whiskey, have a, a chaser of the biscuit pretty much straight after, put the Milky Bar button on your tongue uh, at once you've chewed the biscuit and swallowed it, um, and then uh, and then have another bite of the biscuit and see how you get on. So I'm... Madeline, I haven't got an exotic as you. I've got a plain old custard cream. Because <laughs> with this one, I found personally um, at the end of it, in the finish, it was getting that vanilla, creamy, custardy sort of feeling in the the. the, the back of the mouth and the throat so i thought yeah custard cream and then as i say not as exotic as yours but it works just as well for me well i've got madeline's biscoff and the milky buttons here so they're going wonderfully well that's quite Thanks. a process to to come up with as well i must have taken uh, some some good research that's it's great. not straightforward. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think you can always read the tasting notes and quite it's quite handy that they come with the pack. Um, but the thing is that food is is such a, a difficult thing to pair with whiskey. And there's a really interesting article in this month's Unfiltered um, by Gilly Bassan, where she talks about how texture can be a game changer. Um, so she gives the example of chocolate, which is, if you think about it, it makes total sense. And she says, if you if you chew quickly and swallow um, a bite of chocolate, like, you know, a, a crunchy bar or something like that, you don't really get the full appreciation of it. You're missing roughly two thirds of the flavor story um, is what she says. Um, so you don't separate the texture from the flavor. They have to work together. Um, and it's about how do you do that? So she actually took six of our flavor profiles and kind of gave ideas around if you have, you say, sweet, fruity and mellow whiskeys um, to pair it with something that has like chew or bite 
or is creamy or a bit fizzy and she's done that for six of the flavor profiles so definitely go and check it out um and read it and andrew our producer has handily popped it in there so uh so you can watch it after the lovely drum this john really nice it's just and, really nice. Um, I tell you something a little i always say to our members Please, once you've tasted it neat, add a little bit of water. I know some people don't like adding water, but the trouble is you don't know what you're missing until you know. You know, so I think the, I think the water I just tempers this it, one down a little bit. I think, bit it little, I think it adds a little bit of creaminess to it, you know. It's interesting. Oh, I was where, expecting where? this one to be uh, maybe cleaner than, than it is. It's, uh, yeah, it's a little bit more full bodied than I was expecting. Especially after a bit of water, David, funnily enough. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Once you have it in the glass for a few minutes, I found it become a really nice, well-balanced dram. And for yeah. me, this is one where if you're in for the evening, some whiskies, and there's a couple later on, where they draw you in and you want to explore the dram a bit more. I think once you've got the balance, this one, once you get the balance of the water right and you've just got it, it's one of these drams you don't even have to think about it you just sit and sip it all evening well maybe not all evening but for a good part <laughs> of the evening but you're not having to really sort of focus and concentrate and it's just a very very pleasant easy drinking dram but with a nice bit of character this had a distillery with a with a strange still setup it's got two wash and three three spirit stills there's only one other distillery in Scotland got five stills in the opposite order, three wash and two spirit. So it's quite unusual. And we've got some good tasting notes coming in. Um, I, I like that Mark Lindsay uh, couldn't find milk button, so he's gone for uh, Colin Cal Caterpillar Giant Base White Chocolate. I think that'd be really good. And Azura um, says that cheese might be a great option as well. And, you know, I considered it for this one. I think I think you're on to something there. Colin yeah. the Caterpillar, fantastic, <laughs> <laughs> love it. Hey John, I've got something to show you here It's in connection with this distillery because people might not be familiar with the area or still trying to work out where it is. Now when John and I get together, we usually have chewed the fat a little bit about football at some point during the conversation. So it is football related and it's a programme from the, the Highland League. Oh, there, you there you go, there you go. 1970. And it cost threepence. That was the old threepenny bit, not the the modern uh, two pence and one piece, uh, one pence. So this is a quality program. Given the fact I was at the game, and the, the ground. The interesting fact about it is, the ground of this uh, club is only about a mile from the distillery. And if you see an aerial view from the distillery, looking down towards the town, you see the football ground uh, there as well. So I was in attendance that day um, with this programme, which cost three pence, quality programme, the team's <laughs> inside, a paragraph at the back, the league tables and all the rest adverts, uh, but it cost three pence. Now, the fact there was only several hundred people at the game and probably only about 50 programmes sold, this is a, a collector's item now. So uh, I am taking any bids tonight, starting at £100 for this quality <laughs> programme. But uh, Evanvale, that's the, the, the local football team. As John said, uh, there's two towns effectively split by the, the River Devon, uh, but very, very close to the to the football ground at the facility. So there we go. We've managed to get it in, John. Yeah, well done. Well done, Liz. <laughs> and welcome as well to Stuart and Alison. It's also their first tasting, so welcome. Uh, we've also got some good tasting, some more good tasting notes coming in. Mark Lindsay, pear brandy with water. Um, and uh, you've got a call out as well, uh, John, from, from yeah, Peter. Yeah, hi, Peter. Hi, um, I'll tell you something, yeah. folks, it's worthwhile looking at society for some of these lesser known distilleries from time to time, whenever they appear. This particular distillery, in, our, in, in the last six bottlings we've had of them, we've used bourbon every time, but we've created four different flavour profiles. So that's us working with the, the wood and the spirit to create different flavour profiles for our members to see the differences that can, uh, that can happen over time, you know. So it's very well, well worth following. The other thing, John, with this distillery, if you look at it, 6.45, so it's one of the earlier distilleries yes. in the society you've got a cask from. But in all these years, this is still only the 45th cask yes. that were bottled from this distillery. Uh, and I must admit, it's the first time I've had the pleasure of 
enjoying a society single cast from from this distillery. Because of, because of the popularity of that blend I mentioned, Les William Lawson, it's in the, in the top ten selling single scotches in the world. Yeah. You know, obviously, it's, it's most of it is going to the blend, you know. So it's it's good for us to get our cask every now and again that we can or, or get the spirit when we get in our cask that we can then mature in our warehouse, you know. Talking to William Lawson, um, the first time. <laughs> the first time I came across William Lawson, I was out in holiday in Tenerife, this was just over 30 years ago, uh, and I won this prize, and it was a bottle of William Lawson. i never heard of it before, and I thought, this is going to be absolutely dire rubbish. Uh, took it back home with us and opened it at home, and at first dram, I thought, my God, this is a really, really nice blended whiskey um, for something I'd never heard of. But, of course, I hadn't realised it effectively... <clears throat> everything, almost everything is exported. Yeah. Which is, there's a lot of blends out there that we never see in this country because they're for export only. But um, remember, Les, uh, you, 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 you and me remember like, things like black and white and back six and nine, mm. or that kind of thing. Now you That's don't what see we grew up on, John. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, they all go to foreign markets now. It's horses for courses kind of approach, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, my mum used to put up my hip flask for my school satchel. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Well, an English one, a Welsh one, what was that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think with that... Um, well, an English one, really a Welsh one, uh, well done, well done. Yeah, well done. <laughs> I think it'd be quite a good time, actually, to move on to the to the next dram, if you're ready, Les. I certainly am. I'm just going to have a, a little refresh of my palate. And I'll just say to, to everyone who's tuning in, um, depending on how many tastings you've been with us before... Um, I'd recommend that you, you don't need to finish your dram in, in one go. Um, feel free to kind of come back to them throughout the evening. They'll change throughout the night, especially if you add water. Um, and we asked you in the Facebook um, event group at the start, which ones were your favorite? Um, so be curious to know if that's changed for you at the end of the night. Um, but I'll let Les present the, the next dram, which is 73.120. Thank you, Madeline. And just before I do that, if I can say hello to Brandon and Tabitha uh, and Linda and Monty, who I saw names coming up at the very start, um, some of our local members who attend virtually all the tastings we do when we are in person, which hopefully won't be too far uh, ahead in the future. So welcome tonight, folks. Glad you're on board. Um, I would just like to introduce the, the second whiskey of the night that has got a wonderful name called the, the Scottish Sugar Rush. Um, under a flavour profile, juicy oak and vanilla. It's cast 73.120. Um, quite a young whiskey, eight year old. Um, quite high strength, 58.4%. And it's been matured in a first full X bourbon barrel. And it's from the Speyside area. Um, this one, the nose is absolutely lovely in this one. It's very fresh, fresh laundry fabric conditioner because I'm a modern man I know of all these things my wife allows me to do the washing from time to time once she directs me to where the washing machine that is and <laughs> it on for me I know what to do but lovely nose floral perfumed very very fragrant nose in this one really really nice be careful once you take your first little sip of this because this is obviously where the panel got the name from Scottish Sugar Rush I'm just going to jump in there briefly and say that the uh, 44 is um, now sold out. Um. <laughs> this is immediately, you put that in your mouth and swallow it. Yeah, it's, it's almost like eating something extremely sugary. Uh, but this is where the juiciness comes through uh, with it. Um, very, very sweet. But it's also just got that little bit of a, a, a punch to it as well. And it's possibly because of its younger age, eight year old, but it's still a very, very nice, well balanced dram. Um, it reminded me a little bit uh, on the initial taste without water of coconut macaroon. Now, when we're doing the pairings, um, for me, the obvious one to would have to try would have been a macaroon bar. And unless you're in, from Scotland, you may not know what a macaroon bar is, um, but that's what I would have possibly paired it. Uh, with, but I'll, I'll come to what I did choose eventually. But just in the macaroon bar stories, uh, my dentist here in Harrogate, she's Scottish, and I remember a couple of years ago, I was in the chair, and she's 
talking away to me, and she's um, looking at my teeth. And she says, oh, my mother still sends me down food parcels. She sends me down macaroon bars and, and Scottish tablet. And, she's, and they go straight in the bin. I mean, they're just full of sugar. You wouldn't eat them. And I'm thinking, they're my favorite sweets. But uh, it didn't tell her, obviously. <laughs> um, but this, this, this reminded me initially of that, um, either of the two sweets, where you take a bite and you get that instant sugar rush. Uh, I'm just going to add a little bit of water now. But very juicy, very, very sweet, this one. Now, I did try this one earlier, so I know what I'm going to get here, which is very much the same as I got without adding water uh, on the nose. There's not a great difference, but I just felt it was slightly less intense on the, on the nose with a little bit of water on it. Ah, yes. Not as much sugar. The juiciness is coming through now. So again, you're starting to see, well, you know, where the, the panel put this in in terms of the flavour profile, the juicy oak and vanilla, because it's just very, very much juice uh, coming through this. And again, I was getting this. It just kept reminding me of, of sweets. And I think the, the panel had put in, when we added water, more nostalgic recollections of Scottish sweets, foamy bananas, Edinburgh Rock, Muffet toffee, wine the palate, uh, and creamy lemon meringue pie. Now, unfortunately, I didn't have enough time this afternoon to rustle up a lemon meringue pie, but I can imagine um, instead of having a dessert wine, because we all do that at home every night, obviously, instead of having a dessert wine, this would go wonderfully well with a lemon meringue pie. I thought a key lime pie might work well with it as well. Um, or a, a lemon cheesecake, something like that. But I've got nothing as exotic as that tonight. As I say, I just run out of time in the kitchen this afternoon. I'm ashamed to say I did have to look up the uh, the macaroon bar. I had no idea what one of those was. <laughs> mm. But the juiciness just follows all the way through from your first taste of it without water right through to the finish. And I think I've got the balance just about right with the water now. Um, and it's just lovely, juicy, if you like that style of whiskey. Again, it's one of these easy drinking whiskies. It would be very, very nice at summer barbecue this as well. What I have got to pair with it, before I tell you a little bit more about the distillery, is, and this company, do not sponsor me, I promise you, because on a tasting I did previously, I mentioned that the uh, chocolate ginger biscuits went particularly well with uh, a, a particular whiskey. Um, these are lemon drizzle melts uh, from uh, Border Biscuits. And what I liked about this, and again, like Mad, I went out and bought loads of different things. Uh, and my wife and I had great fun trying all these um, different pairings to come up with the right one. But these, hmm, I think the citrus, the zinginess, and the whiskey just worked wonderfully well with this type of biscuit. The nice thing about pairings is um, having fun with it. We won't all agree that this perhaps goes with this dram. Somebody else might think, well, I've tried that. It just doesn't work for me. But that, that's a nice thing. It's just um, experimenting and finding some lemon curd yogurt. Mm, that sounds interesting. Leslie, I might try that later on with this one. There's some good chocolate orange uh, ideas coming in as well, uh, which I mm. think I think could really work well with this drum. But very, very nice. Just a lovely in the palate. This one's so fresh, floral on the nose. Very, very nice. The distillery itself, um, I don't know if you've ever been to this distillery, John. There's no visitor centre there, so you don't get welcomed in and with open arms. Uh, it's but, a beautiful road, uh, is it? A beautiful road. Oh, oh yeah. Beautiful. Well, when we were up in space a couple of years ago, my wife and I were trying to fit in as many disorders as we could, even those that we couldn't physically go inside, but just go and have a look at the location. This one is absolutely tremendous because we, I stepped out of the car with a camera to take a few photographs, couldn't hear a thing. All you could hear was really the birds singing and just open fields in front of you. It was so remote and quiet, absolutely wonderful. Yeah. 
But the distillery itself is quite a modern building because it was completely rebuilt in the early 70s. I mean, it dates back to 1896, uh, but it was rebuilt in the, the 1970s. So it's more a functional type uh, building now. Uh, became part of the Dewar's family way back in the 1920s. Uh, and like a lot of the distilleries that we've discovered over the last, um, well, certainly since I've uh, been a member of the society, um, some of these distilleries which were unknown to us because virtually everything they produced went into blended whiskey. So you never really knew that they, they existed. Um, and I discovered this one through the society. Uh, and I'm not being smart when I say um, I recognize the spirit in here that's coming from this distillery. But because I've had quite a few uh, single casts through the society from this distillery, this one's only eight year old, but you can tell the direction it was going in. And this distillery, most of the stuff I've had has been um, ex bourbon barrels, as this is, as a first fill. But the spirit matures exceptionally well in sherry casts as well. So uh, 73 is becoming a, a really one of my favorite distilleries. <laughs> I say that about every distillery, to be fair, but uh, there we go. But the spirit has been described, this is not by me, as a, a fresh and delicately sweet, well balanced dram. Uh, and that fits, this one tonight fits into that uh, category as well. The malt they get here comes from uh, down in the borders, from Simpsons down in Berwick. Um, the fermentation time here is quite long. It's a minimum of 60 hours, I understand. And with fermentation, uh, the longer the fermentation, this is where the fruitiness starts to, uh, to build up um, in the wash before it goes through to the spirit stills. Um, being a first fill, it's going to get a lot of the influence from the wood in this one, but only eight year old. This is a cracking dram as well. Um, but that fermentation, longer fermentation, is going to help develop more of the fruity characters in this one. Thank so you. Very, very nice indeed. I think in the mature 73 layers, we often get kind of toffee and chocolate and some citrus notes mm. coming through, you know. Uh, I, it's a I can genuinely hand, I can genuinely hand on heart say, any 73 that's been bottled by the society that I've had the benefit of drinking, they've all been really good. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Very, very good. But it's again, it's one of these lesser known distilleries that until 2014, when the owners decided to start promoting it as a single malt and give it a bit more exposure, uh, that people got to discover it. But this is the benefit of the society as well. We've been doing these bottlings for for years and years bring them to our members but very very uh, nice uh, whiskey indeed i think i think one of the, one of the good things about it as well uh, les is that it does mature very well young young in a younger yes. sense yes. You know, eight, eight nine ten years of age you know yes. so i mean that, that that this this i think is wonderfully complex mm. complete, even though it's only eight years old you know yeah every time i'm taking a sip i'm getting a bit more out of this one yeah, it's just yeah, growing yeah. on me. Really nice. Oh, but you can understand where the panel pop the name Scottish Sugar Rush. Yeah, absolutely. You really can. And and to look at some of the comments about um whiskey and chocolate and pairing them, Martin's asked quite a good question. Um, and I just want to let you all know we actually are doing a chocolate and whiskey pairing with the Dowens Hotel, um, and that can be bought on the Spirit of Speyside um, website. It's a virtual tasting, so um, you can buy tickets for it just now. Those tickets, those tickets go on sale tomorrow at 10 a.m., Matt. Oh, I'm a little bit ahead of myself. I'm just that excited about it. <laughs> chocolate and whiskey, what could go wrong? <laughs> I think the thing is, I think uh, because it's a virtual uh festival this year open to the world it's you're gonna to have to quite quick i think to get some of the tasting packs I mean, okay, you can buy a festival pack and join in but you won't have the tasting packs unless you're quick tomorrow morning so ours will be the same as that we have to be there'll be a limited number quick off the mark um, I think it's actually, um, there's there's a couple of other good comments that have come in as well. So Dastardly Wallace said he wishes that he could, or she, uh, that they could vocalise how things taste the way we seem to. Um, tastes lots of things the way we describe, but would find it impossible to describe and identify those flavours myself. So I wonder if you guys have any advice on on how to, to open that language up a bit more, and if you have any tips that maybe helped you on your whiskey journey for that. I think uh, the, the only thing I would say, uh, 
Mads, is that I think you have to you have to start kind of breaking it down for yourself. So, I mean, some of these quite complex tasting notes don't just arrive immediately in someone's brain. I mean, you, you maybe start saying, "Well, that's fruit, fruity." Okay, what type of fruit is it? Okay, is it raw fruit or is it cooked fruit? And can I, can I do it in a kind of step ladder basis to try to break it down for yourself? But the other incre incredible truth is, is that your sense of smell is one of the most powerful senses that we have. And it's linked in your limb, it's in your limbic system in your brain. Also where our sense of emotion and memory lie. And that's why sometimes we associate an aroma with something in our lives from childhood. So if you actually experience a flavor and aroma that you really, really like, spending a couple of seconds just trying to think where you are, who you're with, what the context is, will help to log that in. Your memory is a long-term memory. And when you come, rather than a short-term memory, when you come across that again, you might be able to remember exactly what it was at the time. So you might find yourself blind tasting a whiskey in three years' time and knowing exactly what it was if you've actually committed that experience to your brain. So it's, uh, and, and the, other, the other thing is just, go around your life every day. Try to take a note of what you're smelling. Try to identify what you're smelling, walking through a forest or something. Just try to build up your smell library so things come back to you. Yeah, and it, it doesn't happen overnight either. It's uh, something that, that no. uh, builds up o over a certain amount of time and uh, definitely something to, to take your time with and not worry too much about, you know, coming up with elaborate tasting notes straight away you know it's uh, it's something that, that definitely comes with time and, and experience that's part of the fun of it really i think as well as tasting different whiskeys Absolutely. and comparing them and yeah i was actually mad talking peter reichwald who was on earlier and he's been on again since he was actually telling me today an email that he thinks he's found some way of helping himself identify aromas so i said i can't wait till we get together in a london venue and have a chat about it I don't know whether you can see anything at the moment, Peter, or whether it's too, too long a story, really, and has to be verbalised. But, uh, but the, he was telling me something about that today. Just, just very quickly, because I know our producers pushing us to, to move on. Um, but in terms of nosing and tasting and picking out flavours and aromas, uh, it's something I was told very, very early on when I was doing my very first whisky course um, twenty odd years ago. Uh, when got samples sent down, had to put our notes and send them back, and the, the, I got a phone call. How did you enjoy that? I said, wonderful. The whiskies were great, but I made a complete mess of the notes when I compared them to the official tasting notes. He says, no, you didn't. He says, because we're all different. So if John and I say we're getting this, and you're thinking, am I missing something here? You're not. Um, we'll all get something different um, because our senses will pick up different. We know from the, the work that we've been doing behind the scenes during lockdown with some of the scientists from the Scotch Whiskey Research Institute and the work they go behind there with the panels that they test each member and some members, um, some, some of their employees will be far better at picking out a certain aroma than others. So we're all different. But as John said, it's just practice, practice, practice. So the more whiskey you, you consume in nose and taste you know sensibly of course and responsibly um but it is there and i don't know mads if this is still on the website but um, might help some people on their initial journey they can Maybe. download the flavor profiles another thing i use is the scotch whiskey research institute flavor wheel so there are tools out there because i still need sometimes just to see something i think yeah that's what i've got uh, just to mm -hmm. confirm it. So there are lots of tools out there, but it's exploration. As John said, just go out and smell things and try and plug it back into your brain so at some point in the future you're, you're going to recall that aroma. And just remember, dastardly, we ambassadors are the sort of people who come along to a tasting and we start off by telling everybody that their sense of smell is completely individual and everybody might get something different. Then we tell you what you should be smelling. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, um, I will, um, if, if you're not in the Facebook event for tonight um, and you're on Facebook, make sure you join. Otherwise, I can share on social media. It's not on the website currently. It will be in the future, but I can share that flavor profile chart for anyone who's interested. 
Um, but while we're talking about flavor, I think it's a really good time to move on to the next jam, which is 35.279. And I think John's going to talk about that one just now. Sure, sure, sure. This is one of the, this is a distillery, which is one of the society members' favorites, without a doubt. This is, this is another distillery which is very, very big in a blend called Label 5, which uh, is, where the primary market is, it is France, it's home market, but it's the primary, it's the primary uh, a malt in that particular blend. Now, this, uh, this is spicy and sweet, and I I think, when I, when I tasted it earlier, or smelled it earlier, I quite a lot of citrus here, an orange peel, even some wild flowers, but then if you just give it a couple of seconds, you get some vanilla and chocolate coming through. And then even some oak drying in the sun, you know, a, a heavier aroma coming through as well. And on the palate, neat, definitely caramel, a spicy butterscotch, no doubt about it. And I was actually getting creamy porridge oats, would you believe, with full fat milk, perhaps sprinkled with some uh, spice, mixed spice and lemon. So it's very, very complex dram. It's uh, 17 years old, it's still the 20th of May 2003, and it's still 60.2%. 60.2%. First of all, bourbon barrel for 17 years is going to have a lot of those sweet flavours in it that you get from a bourbon cask and the previous incumbent. This distillery is a. It's been it's well known actually during its previous ownership. It's now owned by a French company, but due its previous ownership, it was used very much for different oak cask experimentation. So you used to get a lot of this distillery in different types of cask because uh, the, the owners decide to use it for that kind of innovative experimental style of approach. And so you get uh, many, many different types of flavours from this distillery. And, we, and we have, we've effectively done the same. So we take the spirit and we try it different casks and see what different kind of flavour profiles that we get from it. So we've it's had actually, a wee question yep. there, John, uh, just um, for the for the link for the shopping. So I'm just going to jump in with that with that quickly. It's uh, smws.com forward slash vmt dash shopping. Uh, so smws.com forward slash vmt hyphen shopping. Sorry, on you go, John. Yeah, sure, don't worry. Now, I think that I suggested, because of the creaminess in this dram, along with a little citrus hit, I suggested painting it with a porter or a stout, you know? Because, uh, what was it, Compton McKenzie? Compton McKenzie, who wrote the book, uh, the, the, the famous book, uh, Whiskey Galore, he said, beer does not taste like itself unless, it's, unless it is chasing a dram of neat whiskey down the gullet, preferably two drams. So I've got myself here tonight. Since the Patrick's Day was yesterday, I've gone for the old favourite. Tried and Guinness. true. Guinness. Okay. I don't know if anybody else has got themselves one. I've got uh, an Orinoco, Orinoco Mocha Milk Stout from Drygate. Um, so okay. it's, got a, it's got an interesting coffee note in it, which is really nice. In Scotland, of course, this is called a half and a half, meaning a half and a half. A half a beer and a half a whiskey together. Very famous pairing in Scotland. No, this is fantastic. Um, I, I saw the high ABV and I thought I'll oh, add a drop of water, maybe try and sort of uh, tame it. And if anything, I feel like the palate's become more intense, but really, really good. Yeah, yeah. I think at 60%, you really have to try out a little bit of water, don't you? Yeah. 
I think, yeah, I, well, I just think it, I think the creaminess is accentuated with the water. Mm. Being. We've uh, we've also had a really good question from Andy, um, which where he's asked, uh, he's he said, I've heard a few savvy tasters say the sense in the air of the room they taste play a part. Some even use a cigar to thicken it. So what are our thoughts on the room air being important um, as a taste pairing? Well, I, I, uh, I think it's, a, it's, it's incredibly important. It's not just, not just the room that you're in. It's the, the whole context of the situation when you're drinking the whiskey. If you're drinking a whiskey on a home alone, watching a good film, you're probably going to get a completely different experience than if you're sitting in a Scottish small whiskey society venue with a bunch of friends having a bit of banter and a bit of a laugh. Or it depends what you've eaten or what time of day. That's why most uh, most distillery tasters, the bl master blenders, mostly always taste at the same time of day, having eaten exactly the same things up to the point where they do the tasting. So you, you hear many of them say it's between 11 and 12 in the morning. They get up at the same time every day. They have breakfast, the same the same breakfast. So they get to the, the tasting point with, with very... As, as, as low a number of differentials as they could possibly manage, you know, because it can definitely change. I actually had a SMWS whiskey last year. It was a one, two, one. I drank half of it and I went back to it one evening and poured a dram. I thought, oh, this is the best whiskey I've had this year. This is fantastic. Why did I not think that when I was drinking the other half of the bottle? It was just the moment. It was just the context. You know, so don't think that you can have a whiskey tonight and not have the same whiskey tomorrow night or the following night and not get different flavours. You know, that's the wonder of it. It's the magic of it, actually. Well, and we've had some some more questions. We've got some really good questions coming in tonight, guys. Uh, Martin Wilson has asked, uh, does the society ever request certain characteristics for a cask from the distillery, as in make a whiskey to order? Or do they only ever buy the casks they have in stock? I think it's an important point. To, it's a good question, Martin. And the point is that it, when, when we first started, way back in 83, Pip would have gone to distilleries and, and, and tasted, knows some casks and decided which one he was going to buy. These days, we tend to make, mature the whiskey ourselves. So we will actually give the distillery our own casks. They'll fill it with new make spirit and we'll take it back to our warehouse to mature it. And we'll decide by our spirits team's expertise how long it stays in that cask, whether we finish it in a different cask or extra mature it in a different cask or whatever. So really it's not the same as it used to be in going to a distillery and saying, can I have that cask over there? You know? Just, just to add to that, John, uh, I remember doing a tasting up in... Durham, I think about three or four years ago, <clears throat> and one of the members there was asking me about the casks, and I was telling them the same, that we've now got our own warehouse, so we've got more control over it, uh, and how it used to be when we started. And he came up with a, a phrase which I've used over and over again uh, since then. He says, oh, so you've went from being a curator to a creator. Yeah. And I thought that just... It's a good, that's just a good one, actually. It's a good one. Mm, yeah, because... You know, when you and I started as ambassadors uh, at that time, well over 90% of the casks were bought in and um, part matured from the distillery. But uh, now you and the team are doing wonderful jobs and going out and buying some amazing casks um, from Kentucky, from Hereth and in, in, in France. Um, so for our members, the future is, is amazing because there's going to be some incredible whiskies. Um, coming out, some incredible whiskies coming out now, but uh, even more to look forward yeah. to in the future. Good point, Alexander. That's, the, that's a, exactly, yes, well said. I'd also just like to say, I know it's a few friends of mine have come up on the, I haven't had a chance to mention yet. Anne Bingham's come up. Now, Anne is one of the, Anne's the girl who sent me through the pronunciation of that long Welsh town. So thank you, Anne. I probably got it terribly wrong. No, and also, my friends in Frankfurt have made appearance. Nad Nadja and Jens, I see you. I see you're on there. Great stuff. Uh, good to see you. And of course, Peter's been on as well. 
And if Damien Asari is on, let's give us a shout, Damien, because I know you were looking forward to it too. John, John, distillery number 35, the one we're on, um, you're probably aware that I spent a lot of my younger years uh, in the, the town of Elgin where the distillery 35 is from. Um, so as well as producing magnificent whiskies, it does have a little bit of a soft spot for me. Uh, now, people might not realise this or believe me, but I can tell you, having lived in Elgin for many, many years, um, the climate there is actually not too bad from where it's located. It's sunnier and milder. No, no, this is true. This no, is, you as well as. This is, not, this is not fake news. This is actual fact. And if there's anybody tuning in from the Elgin area, you can confirm this. The climate's sunnier and milder due to its location. Now, we're only six miles from the coast there. And now the scientists would have to confirm this, but I don't disbelieve the distillery when they, they, they say this. Um, but the area of Elgin is quite low lying. It's called the Lake of Murray. And lake means uh, low in Scottish Gaelic. And there's also a high water table in the area as well. And they reckon that um, this produces a, a more humid microclimate in the warehouses um, for the maturing stock. Now, that may be a factor in some of the amazing whiskies that come out of this distillery. Just don't know, but the distillery say this, and you think, well, there could certainly be truth to that because we know how important the location of the warehouse is. Um, Isle of Arden, for example, they chose their spot in Loch Ranza because they did a lot of research and the microclimate there was perfect for maturation. So the, there may be something in that with um, with this distillery. I think, uh, I think, I think there's, there's a, I've heard... I've heard people say they get 40 days more summer than the rest of Scotland. <laughs> oh, fantastic. I mean, that's a reason to move there. <laughs> and in the bear, 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 bear in mind, bear in mind that Elgin's in roughly the same latitude as Moscow, you know. <laughs> but the, the amazing thing is, though, John, in the middle of winter, um, Elgin would be all right. You could go not even 20 miles, 10 miles south to Rothes, and you need a slow snow plow to get through the road. Uh, it was well, just a well, job. Well, I would just like to remind people what that great philosopher Billy Connolly said about Scottish weather. Billy Connolly said, "In Scotland, we only get two seasons: winter and June." <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about the same for Wales, actually. Yeah, you get rain, <laughs> rain, and uh, September. That's about it. <laughs> Uh, we'll have to get some. We'll have to get some meteorologists to confirm the, uh, the stuff about Elgin. <laughs> but, 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 just, just before we move on a little bit, it's, it's interesting what you were saying there, Les, from the point of view that it is a fact, isn't it? And science can't tell you why. Uh, not one hundred percent, at least. No, every single distillery has got a different new make spirit, and, uh, and some distilleries just put it down to a thousand little quirks. And that might be what goes on inside the distillery, but also might be the weather around the distillery. So that's what's just so fascinating about sports in general, you know. Indeed. I mean, I think I think that's the thing that it boils down to is each one of these whiskies is unique and, and we all also have our own experience with it, which makes them doubly unique. Um, and, and on that note, Les, I think it'd be a really uh, great time to move on to 44.139, Kiss me, you fool, which is is the really low outturn. Uh, so I think there were only 54 bottles in this outturn, which is a, a really small amount. Um, and uh, and I think you've got a bit more information on that. Uh, it must have been a leaky cask. That's all I can think of um, for that to happen. I can only remember one time before, and I managed to actually get one of the bottles. There was the outturn was something like 89 bottles, absolutely incredibly low. Uh, so for those of you who have been fortunate enough to nab one tonight, well done in that. Congratulations, because um, very, very low outcome as well. So this one, kiss me, uh, you fool. 44.139, sweet, fruity and mellow. Now, we just had a discussion just a few minutes ago and people saying, well, you know, is it a, a, a trick or can you train yourself to pick out these aromas and, and flavours? Well, this is one where I need a bit of help because out of the five whiskies tonight, this is the one that I really struggled with the most um, because there was so much going on with it. To be able to pick out individual aromas or flavours was 
really quite challenging with this one. Um, so as I say, Sweet, Fruity and Mellow. It's from the Speyside region. It's a second fill, ex-bourbon barrel. Um, 13 years of age and uh, the ABV is 49.1, so considerably less than what we've been um, having uh, earlier this evening. Um, but on the nose, and I picked up, and I'm not just saying this because I know about the distillery, which I'll discuss later on and where some of these um, the flavours and aromas come from. But I picked up just the slightest bit of meatiness, sulfuriness there, the meaty first, and then fruity. And if you leave your nose in the glass as time goes on, the fruitiness starts to come more to the fore than this just a little bit meaty. Um, the panel says something about waxiness with this one as well, which I didn't get initially, but then I, I did. But not an unpleasant note, but newly opened paint. Nice one, Ian. Now I got a bit of chalkiness from me in my school days. Um, possibly many of you can't remember chalk at school because you're too young, but um, we did have blackboards, and uh, you'll remember that, John, as well. So I don't know that, if that's where the chalkiness is coming from. With this one, if you haven't done it with the other drums you've had tonight, I would suggest, as I call it, chewing it. And you can't really chew liquid, but really put it in your mouth and really let it go around your mouth and it starts to release a bit more of its secrets. I think it's a pineapple and a lemon. It comes through very strongly for me, Les. Mm. Mm. It's coming through now. As I say, initially on the nose, you don't get it. Initially in the palate, you don't get it. But if you chew it, all of a sudden it becomes much more fruity in character with this one. Yeah, I was definitely getting the pineapple on, on this. I think it mentioned pineapple jelly in the notes. So as soon as yeah. I was nosy, I was like, oh, yeah, definitely getting that. Well, I mean, funny enough, we've come to, come to the pairings. I've picked something which isn't in the tasting notes, which my wife and I didn't pick up. But we both came to the conclusion. <laughs> That's it. Well done, John. Got it. <laughs> I'm just going to add a little bit of water now. A few drops of water to this one. 49.1, so it may not need as much as the other ones. Lovely. We've got uh, we've got a, a question that's not entirely relevant to this dram, but it's a really good question from Joel, um, and he said, given that the society are now maturing whiskies themselves, what does this mean for the malts that are hot climate whiskies like one thirty four and one three eight that are sold young because they theoretically mature faster? Is SMWS maintaining its own warehouses in those countries? Not I'm aware of. I think the cast will come straight because they're so young. I would imagine, I don't know, you might know better than myself, John, but I think we just get them over here. The tasting panel would have tasted the samples first before we'll ship the cask over. Uh, but you're right, yeah. these, hot, these hot climates, and I can't re recall the actual figure, but it was something like a three-year-old whiskey from India is equivalent to a 15-year-old whiskey from Scotland uh, because of the and uh, the, the other thing is, because of the because of the climate in Scotland, we're losing uh, water and alcohol. Uh, but the, the, al the alcohol level stays pretty; it, go, it reduces slowly over time. In these very hot climates, it's the water that evaporates out of the cask because the air sucks it up, and the, al the alcohol gets higher because alcohol is not taken as much as the water. So the trouble is, and I think in Goa, we are a uh, Paul John, for example, are based. And they, they, their loss of volume is something ten like percent per annum. So I mean, so so you, you have to balance the. I mean, the, th the thing is maturing quickly, more quickly because of the hot climate. But they couldn't leave it for too long anyway. And it's the same in Kentucky, really. You know, so, yeah, yeah, there's, there's a big, big difference in terms of what the climate does in terms of maturation for sure. But, but, but Les is right mainly on the, on, the, on the cask from these countries that we'll bring the cask over after having tasted it. 
some wonderful comments coming in there about uh, what they're getting. You couldn't get the exact lint chocolates but substituted with Link White on this. As I say, we've got these home and it just seemed to go wonderfully well with the fruitiness. And unlike um, a bar of chocolate, which I've got for the, the next whiskey, um, you just, this melts in the mouth. I, I struggled with this one a wee bit initially as well, mm. Les, and when I was trying to come up with a pairing for it, it just it was the one that was a bit of an enigma where I just couldn't really tell what I, what I wanted, what direction I wanted to go in. Mm. But I'm seeing a lot of kind of citrusy, or not citrusy notes, but certainly white chocolate for me pulls the sweetness out of the dram in a really lovely way. Um, mm. And uh, it's completely transformed it for me. Yeah. It's, it's uh, as I say, this is the one dram out of the five that I had struggled because there was so much going on and to pick out individual flavours and aromas. So, you know, full marks to the tasting panel for coming up with all that. I In the last I've, still, time, I've, I've, still got to, I've still got to find out which member of the tasting panel has this crushed aspirin because I've come across this several times. It's not Dr. Andy, is it? The, the, the crushed aspirin. Know, I'm going to buy a packet of aspirins if I can, crush them up and just smell them and, <laughs> and see what I get. <laughs> On this actual distillery, I know you'll have seen it, John. Um, and again, it's one of these without a visitor centre. Um, fantastic when it's based in the town of a uh, village of Craigellachie and the way to Dufftown. So anybody going to Dufftown will pass through Craigellachie and you can't help but notice the distillery because it's this just huge building on the left-hand side, uh, and you just got to stop on the roadside and admire the still house. Just, it's just there right in front of you. And if you pass on a day where it's quite warm and the still house windows are open, it's an amazing sight. Um, it's known locally, or used to be certainly, as the White Horse Distillery. And it, even a few years ago, I'm going back maybe seven, eight years ago, uh, when we went up uh, to Dufftown, and you could still see faintly in the wall white horse uh, because when this distillery uh, was opened uh, many 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 years ago in the late 1800s and um, not sure, can't remember the exact date and um, it was the heart of white horse whiskey so it was known locally for many many years as the white horse distillery and <clears throat> we talk about game changers and things that are different and well, it's a game changer, but this distillery gets uh, all its malt from Glenesk Maltings uh, just north of Montrose. And I remember when I lived in Arbroath uh, going up the road, and at that time it was uh, Hillside Distillery, which uh, sadly closed down, but uh, the building stayed there uh, and it became a Maltings. Uh, and the, the barley they use is a mix of uh, Concerto and Laureate barley. But what they do there differently, and the brand ambassador was telling us, as far as he's aware, they are the only distillery in Scotland that, that does this, that the request that sulfury notes uh, <laughs> the killing. And they, it's done by using a direct oil-fired kiln, which gives us sulfury notes, because this is what they want in the new makes spirit. And again, I haven't had the benefit, but he was telling us that when you nose and you make spirit, it's the sulfur that you get straight away. Now, many, many years ago, there was great, I'm saying many, it wasn't that many years ago, there was great debate about sulfur and, you know, bad and all the rest. And other people were coming in, like Dr. Bill Lumsden and Glenn Morris, and saying a little bit of sulfur isn't too bad for you. Uh, but with this one, um, during the process of maturation, he says, on the nose and you make spirit is sulfur, taste it, it's fruity. Uh, and he was telling us that the longer the maturation, the fruitiness starts to overtake. Um, but in this one, I, I I don't know if it's just my mind because I know the facts behind it. I'm thinking, yeah, I was getting a little bit of meatiness, selfie uh, nose uh, on the, uh, the whiskey. A famous, a famous whiskey writer, uh, Les, once described the new make spirit here is it's like firing a shotgun through a pineapple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's great. And, but, 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 but the, thing, the thing is, but you're right about the sulfur, that it's meant to be meaty. Mm. You know, it's, it's kind of the beast of space aid. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the malt star who, the malt star who, who delivers their malt, 
the sulfur malt said to them, you guys are mad, you know, but that's <laughs> deliberate, you know. But I mean, yeah. just, but just going back to that point about what we do after we get it, I'm just looking here. We In the last 30 or 40 bottlings of this, of Craig Ellicke, oh, sorry, sorry, 48, We've had, we've had seven different flavor profiles, you know. We've created seven seven different flavor profiles, so it just shows what you can do with that spirit once you get it back to the the warehouse and you work with it through cast maturation. And yeah, another thing to have there, John, as you know, is uh, worm tubs, which yes, yes, a dying art. That was the traditional way of cooling the vapor that came off the stills um, yeah. until they invented this yeah. shell and tube condenser. But this is one of, we think, 19 to 20 distilleries which are still using the old worm tubs. So there's less copper contact, and that makes the spirit a bit more meatier, um, which you can pick up in some of their expressions. That's right, that's right. Yeah, that's funny enough, I was just about to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we On you go, David. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. No, I was just, I was actually going to say, um, unless you've got something else, David, um, we've had a, quite a good question um, that I'd like to highlight before we move on to your drum. No, go ahead. Um, so Martin Wilson, uh, on fire with the questions tonight, uh, has said, I could never remember all the cask numbers released. Does a cask released just get given the next available cask number from that distillery, or do they get assigned in the warehouse? So his question is basically, has Distillery 6 released 45 casks or are there some casks between 1 and 45 that maybe haven't been released yet? No, no, no. 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 no normally, they'd just be released in numerical order, you know? There need to be a funny reason why that never happened. Maybe one has been held back for one of our foreign branches or something, you know? Uh, but normally, it's just numerical medical order release i've seen on a case it's very very rare uh, that in terms of releasing it as a bottle has been out of sync um because one they've both been through the tasting panel obviously <clears throat> been approved but say you know cast number 102 was released before 101 only by a couple of weeks or something like that so it's very very rare but as john said it's, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It's always in numerical order it's hard enough remembering all the numbers. If you start to mix them up like that, we would have no chance. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Um, well, with that in mind, uh, actually, there is one great question, and then we'll, we'll move on to David. Alexander Wintons asked, how much control does the SMWS have on the flavour profile, or does it depend on the distillery? So that, that, that's, I think it was Alexander who asked the question before about casks. So it's, it's basically the same answer, Alexander, in that we are effectively making making the whiskey. You know, we've got the new mix spirit and it's our casks and we're effectively creating the flavours in the whiskey. So it's our flavour profile. Our flavour profile is decided by our panel, our tasting panel, no one else. So that's uh, that's completely in control of society. And it is all about flavour, which we're going to hear more about from David, who's going to talk about 128.13. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank, thank you very much. And, and thanks, everyone, for, for having me this evening. It's uh, been a great night already. But, uh, of course, we've got another whiskey yet to do. So uh, go ahead and pour yourself the, uh, the next one here, 128.13. And... Um, this distillery, of course, is a little bit more obvious than some of the others in that uh, it's the only Welsh one that I think the society uh, has, has bottled. And um, there's actually been a great relationship, I think, between Penderyn and the society in that I think we sold our first casks to the society back in 2003 or 2004 or something before we'd even uh, started selling our own whiskey. So <laughs> the, only, the only independent bottlings of the whiskey uh, have been from the society from you know that time all the way until I think just last year. Uh, so it's it's kind of been a little exclusive uh, way of, of tasting Pendarin and, and one of the only ways of tasting uh, independently bottled Pendarins, which I think is just so unique and, and so different. And uh, yeah, there, there are some things that I think make the distillery really interesting and unique and, and kind of a game changer in, in itself as well. 
Um, I'm, I'm not going to try and bore everyone too much with uh, you know too much uh, information and too much of this uh, PowerPoint presentation, but I do have a, a PowerPoint here. Hopefully, this is going to work and everyone can see this. Um, but this is it. This is the distillery, Penderin Distillery. So this is where we are based in the Brecon Beacons, in the national park there in, in South Wales. And we started the distillery in the year 2000. So it's very much a, a modern distillery, quite a new distillery uh, in, in a lot of ways. And it was just a, a group of friends that sort of came together. Actually, funnily enough, quite similar to, to the story of the society in some ways, in that it was just this crazy, crazy idea. Um, there hadn't been a whiskey in Wales for over 100 years. And the people that started the distillery were considered you know, completely insane uh, for, for trying to do this. So um, it, it, it's turned into a, a, an amazing success story, really, over the years. But of course, the first years were, were very, very difficult. Um, but now, you know, 20, 21 years on, um, we're still sort of pushing the boundaries of, of flavor and, and doing some uh, amazing things. Uh, this is the area that the distillery is in, the Brecon Beacons. If you haven't ever had a chance to visit, please uh, go and do so because it's just a stunning area, really amazing uh, views over over the hills there. Um, if you if you haven't already uh, tasted the whiskey, feel free to uh, you know have a have a nose, have a taste of some of that, and uh, get your comments in with you know tasting notes and uh, all the rest of it. Just while I'm sort of talking through uh, some of this stuff as well. And of course, the, the reason that we're really there in the Brecon Beacons uh, is, is for the water. So the distillery is built on uh, a water source there. And we're pulling that water up from uh, up from the ground underneath the distillery of a borehole down to that. Um, so of course, it's one of the main reasons that the distillery sits where it is in the Brecon Beacons. Um, and I'd say one of the main differences with Penderin, you know, there's all sorts of things that we're doing with you know, the mashing and the malt that we're using. We're doing long fermentations, all this kind of stuff. But the main difference for me is the type of still that we're using. So this is called a Faraday still. And the Faraday still is very different to uh, a lot of other distilleries. You can kind of see that with the shape uh, here on the screen. And it's not this sort of curvy, bulbous shape that you see from uh, a lot of pot stills. And it, it's almost like a hybrid between a pot and a column still in a lot of ways in that you have this sort of pot shape at the bottom where the wash is being filled into, it's being heated, and then it's going into the, the column here. Um, and if you know anything about sort of column distillation, all this kind of stuff, you just know that it's going to help to separate the alcohol, separate the, the different flavors, and, and purify the alcohol really well as well. But I would stress that it's, uh, it's not quite like the grain whiskey distillation in that it's not going to uh, get up to like a really, really high strength where the spirit's neutral. We're pulling a huge, huge amount of flavor uh, out of this still as well, even though the spirit is coming off at a very high strength. Um, so for normal sort of double pot distillation, the spirit's coming off at maybe 70%, um, sometimes a bit lower, sometimes a little bit higher. Um, even, you know, Irish whiskies and some Scotch whiskies are doing triple distillation. Maybe with that, you get to a little bit higher, something like 80%. But from this still, we're pulling off alcohol that's over 90%. So it's really, really pure as it comes off the still. But um, as I said, we're pulling a lot of, a lot of flavor along, along with that. But it just gives the whiskies a completely different style. They're a lot lighter, uh, a lot more delicate normally. Um, but we do have some double pot stills in the distillery. Um, you can see just behind the stills here um, on the, the left of the photo, you can see the Faraday stills at the back. And uh, here in the middle are two sort of more traditional pot stills. And we put these in a little bit more recently. Um, so it does mean that not a lot of this whiskey is available yet, but I do believe the society has uh, some casks of this double distilled uh, spirit. So it's gonna be really, really interesting to see um, what's coming off from these and, and the flavors and how those will be different uh, for, from different casks. So that's sort of something to look forward to uh, as well from, from the society and from Penderin as well. And then two sort of important people, I think, to the story as well are Dr. Jim Swan, who, who was very heavily involved with Penderin you know, from the very, very early days. And I think that was the best thing that, that we could have done uh, at the beginning is sort of get someone with so much experience involved uh, in the distillery. And Jim's been involved with dozens and dozens of, of different distilleries over the years, but um, he was only ever the official master distiller of two distilleries, which was Penderin and Cavalan in Taiwan. So that kind of speaks to the uh, involvement that he had uh, with, with the distillery. 
very sadly, of course, Jim passed away a few years ago, which was such a big blow to us because he was a huge part of us creating the whiskies and the different casks that we've used. Uh, but he's been training some people at the distillery to be able to take over from him. So Eister there in the, uh, the bottom photo, she's been uh, training under Jim for about five years before uh, sort of taking over the, uh, the blending side uh, of things at the distillery. Um, and then sort of looking to the future, this is just the last thing I wanted to talk about in the PowerPoint is uh, we're building some new distilleries in Wales at the moment. So you can kind of see on the map there of Wales where Penderyn is at the moment. And then we're hoping to open a distillery in Llandudno in uh, North Wales. Thankfully, it doesn't have as hard a name as uh, John did earlier. Um, so we're opening that hopefully in March and then Swansea Distillery will be the, the year after. So it's, uh, it's going to be a, a sort of big project step for us as, as we're looking to the future for um, you know what what's next for Welsh whiskey what's next for us and uh, this is sort of where it goes to these different distilleries and exploring these different flavor profiles that we can create and, and making Welsh whiskey more of a an industry I think that's gonna be really really interesting to see uh, how all that pans out for for the future absolutely We've, we've already got uh, some questions for you, David. And uh, yeah, Greg Milney, um, he's asked, is it Welsh whiskey or whiskey with an E? It's whiskey without an E, because I think that was the original spelling. But uh, there is also whiskey with a G, which is the Welsh spelling of, of whiskey. Oh. I think that's on some of the packaging that we use, maybe not all of it. Um, as you've probably noticed from my accent, everyone, I'm, I'm not Welsh. Uh, I'm an Englishman. I'm from Surrey, but uh, I moved to Wales about eight years ago, so uh, I kind of feel adopted now, adopted Welsh. Um, so yeah, no, it's uh, it is good. And and this whiskey, this whiskey is fantastic. I, I think this is a really wonderful example of of Pendarin. You've chosen quite a good match for it as well. Do you want to tell us a bit about? Yeah, ab ab absolutely. I was really excited to, to sort of pair something with this whiskey and particularly with the sherry cask uh, maturation as well, because I think that's really uh, interesting. We don't see a lot of Penderins from uh, sherry casks. I think even myself, you know, being the global brand ambassador, I've only tasted one or two uh, Penderins you know, just from sherry casks. Um, and so I was sort of excited to, to pair something interesting with this. So I picked dark chocolate covered cherries, uh, which is something quite easy to do at home, I thought. So you get just fresh cherries um, and dip them in, in dark chocolate. And I think that sort of helps to, the dark chocolate helps to bring out some of the uh, sweetness from uh, from the whiskey. And then you get the, the sweetness and the juiciness of the cherries uh, coming in as well. I think it's uh, yeah, really good sort of pairing for this one. <clears throat> I, I tried that while you were uh, presenting. Um, just so that no one had to watch me try and, and eat a chocolate cherry on camera. <laughs> um, and it was um, it was delicious. I can attest that it's um, it's a really lovely combination. Um, we've had a great question from Philip Dixon as well, um, which is what type of, what types of casks are your preferred choice for filling? Well, we do a lot of uh, ex bourbon barrels, uh, of course, as as a lot of distilleries do. Um, we tend to do finishings. So we'll uh, put the whiskey into a bourbon barrel and then finish it uh, in a Madeira cask. And, and Madeira is really the style that we're known for. We buy a huge number of Madeira barrels. Um, and that, I think, sets us apart because there aren't a huge number of Madeira barrels used for whiskey maturation at all. So our sort of main version of the whiskey uh, is finished in Madeira cask. Which I think that was really your first commercial release, David. It was, it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So... But with the sherry, we normally, we do a sherry wood version, but it's a mix of bourbon and sherry casks. So it's only about 30% sherry casks. So what I find really interesting about this one is that it's full maturation in, uh, in a sherry cask, in a sherry butt, and, and that's giving the whiskey this wonderful uh, sweetness, but it hasn't overwhelmed the whiskey at all, which I think really, it helps that it's a second fill cask because it, it, I, sometimes <laughs> I feel like Pendarin is very light. It's very delicate whiskey and it can easily be overwhelmed. So putting it into a second fill cask really helps that, the, the spirit and the sherry to balance uh, really nicely together. The, the panel came up with, and I agree with him 100% after trying it before, <clears throat> it says when we added plenty of water, and it does need plenty of water, uh, and gave it a little bit of time to rest. Uh, and when I tried this earlier, um, it transformed after about five minutes, and it just became a fantastic drum. It was nice before that, but that five minutes with a, a decent 
glug of water and made it just wonderful. And if it was a blind taste, and I don't think anybody could have guessed that this was only seven year old. No, absolutely. And of course, because we're a young distillery, we don't tend to do a huge number of uh, older bottlings, older whiskies. Uh, we have uh, a few casks uh, from, from the old days, but uh, really not many. But some of the young stuff coming through is fantastic. And in terms of age, you know, I, I, uh, we used to do a version of the whiskey. It was a single cask uh, as an exclusive for the visitor center. It was only three years old, but I used to take it to tastings uh, when I was out and about and I'd have it as like a last final whiskey, um, like a mystery whiskey. And I'd give it to people and say, oh, how old do you think it is? And people would uh, would be like, oh, you know, it's 10 years old, it's eight, it's 15. And you tell them, you know, it's three years old. That's the minimum age a whiskey can be. And, and people's jaws would, would literally you know, drop to the floor. It was amazing to see that, that just instant change of perception of what a whiskey could be like uh, when it's young. And, and when you don't have all those sort of misconceptions about uh, about the age and what whiskey should taste like, it kind of takes those away. Wonderful. I noticed that comment there. I think it was Jim Cameron came up there and said, he's loving it neat and he'll try it with a little bit of water later and uh i always always say to people despite what i said earlier but always try it with a little bit of water sometimes if you only have one dram of something and you're loving it neat and then somebody somebody something's ringing in your ear that somebody told you, you should always try water and you're terrified in case you spoil it for yourself you've only got one dram if you've got a bottle it's okay you can drink the rest of it neat if you spoil it with the water but i think at that kind of strength a couple of drops will probably, you know, like I'll, I'll, not, I'll not waste it for you, put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. 62.2 is, uh, is, is a pretty high cast strength. So, yeah. Well, we've actually um, had a question about ABV um, for you, David, actually, which yeah. is do you, do you have a set ABV when filling your casks? Patrick's asked that. We do, yeah, of course, uh, and a lot of distilleries do the, the same kind of thing. But I think with us, it's perhaps even more extreme because the spirit we're pulling off the Faraday stills is 90% alcohol. That would do very, very weird things in, in a barrel. And we'd lose a lot of alcohol to the angel's share, of course, and um, just wouldn't interact with the cask in the best way. So we bring it down to 63.5%, which is quite standard for, for the industry, really, before we're putting it into the barrels. And then normally, we're releasing whiskeys at 46 or 41% rather than <coughs> So we water it down after we take it out of the barrels as well. Excellent. Got another question here from Martin as well, uh, which is, does Pendaren do single malt releases only or use for blends? It's, it's really only for single malt releases. Um, and part of the reason for that, I think, is because um, it's one of the only Welsh distilleries. So you can't necessarily use it in a, in a scotch blend and, and call it scotch. You could perhaps use it in, uh, in like a world blended whiskey. And I think there have been things done with that. I think um, the the Lakes Distillery was releasing yeah, the one blend, which was from from each of the countries in the UK. So I think Pendaren was included in that. But normally it's only and, and, and David Japanese distilleries are doing it all the time without telling you. Yeah, well, that's been in the news a lot recently, hasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> very current. David, you very kindly sent us some samples when we first spoke seems like ages ago now. Uh, and I admitted at that time, I had very little experience of uh, Pendern in the past. I think I'd only had one before, which was a, a very, very young dram. And I've never been able to get anything from the society because <laughs> they sold out very, very quickly. So you kindly sent us uh, samples. And this is just to prove to everybody who's tuning in tonight, you know, this is a laborious job and we could put a lot of research into this. I've got three pages of notes um, on the samples that you sent me. But the, the thing that was coming through with every one, with all your whiskies, was refreshing and fruity. Yeah. And when we got the tasting notes down the other day, and I'm look because I always sample before I look at the tasting notes, I'm not influenced. And I was delighted to see that the panel got refreshing, long and fruity. Um, and, and that's what I got out of all your whiskies. Is that what you'd expect from Pindern with with any of your bottlings? Yeah, I, I think it's it's very in keeping with the style. Um, the way that some people describe it is is sometimes it's like summery, you know, in that sort of refreshing way. It's it's a whiskey that you can uh, sit outside in the summer and and enjoy. 
It's uh, it's not necessarily one of those whiskies, you know, for wrapping up in in the winter by a fire. You know, there are very much some whiskies like that. But uh, I do find Pendarin is a bit more summery, a bit more refreshing uh, normally, just as you say. It's one for a hip flask trampling over the brick and beacons, David. Eh? Absolutely, yes, yeah, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> We've had another question from Grant, which is about your water source. Uh, so he says, when you cut the spirit for casking and for bottling, what is the source of the water? Is it the borehole? Yeah, yeah, it'll be the, the borehole. I mean, we, of course, water is uh, hugely and hugely important to, to the whiskey process. One of, one of the only uh, ingredients. So the, the water that we're using is pretty much all from, from the borehole uh, that, that we've got on site. Um, just for one thing, it's it's cheaper than than using anything else. So, uh, and, and of course, as I said, that's really where the, the reason why the distillery is where it is. So it's hugely important to to our story. Good to see you, Grant. By the way, yeah, I think, I mean, sitting with this dram and just enjoying it, I keep wanting to eat the other chocolate cherry that's here, but also I just want to enjoy the dram a bit longer because I, I think it is one where. It takes a wee while to release its complexities, but then when it does, it's a real treat. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, I, I tried this one neat before, but uh, just with a touch of water, it's uh, really helping it to open up and become uh, a little bit more juicy, a little bit more fruity. Um, and and yeah, it's a really, really interesting sort of version of Pendarian. I, it's one of the great things I think about the society is, uh, is that you get to explore these sort of flavor profiles that aren't necessarily in keeping with what you'd find from the distillery normally um so it's really really great to see it's like a completely different version of pendarin and certainly a, a game changer we've got alex asking if you uh, if you use welsh barley so yeah this is a question that we get quite a bit um and we don't tend to use welsh barley i think we did use welsh barley for about six months one year um but we don't tend to most of the barley comes from england um from sort of the East Coast. And if you know anything about Wales, you know it's very, very wet. Uh, it rains a lot, uh, of course, just as it does in, in Scotland as well. But um, yeah, the barley doesn't tend to grow very well. So uh, we don't uh, we don't get a huge amount of barley here. And uh, most of the barley comes from England. I think um, when when you, you came on and, and you spoke to uh, the ambassadors and, and did a bit of training um, about Pandaren and, and Give us all the knowledge and you also taught us a bit of welsh yes so I, ab I absolutely wondered if you might if you might share that with our members as well well I, as i mentioned you know i'm english i don't know a huge amount of welsh uh, i can't speak welsh but i think that some of the most important words that you can learn in in welsh are yachida and yachida is like cheers it's like slange of course you have in scotland um so you know to everyone this evening i hope you've enjoyed uh, all of the whiskies. I hope you've enjoyed the Pendarin and sort of learnt something. And uh, yachida. 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 <laughs> well, before we finish up, I'm curious uh, to hear from each of you what your um and uh, and and feel free to drop it in the comments. Um, but at the end of it all, uh, there are a few more tastings coming up. So our next virtual tasting is on the 22nd of April. Um, I'll be hosting and we also have Olaf and Kami um, and the Glasgow Hip Flask Hiking Club. Um, so they'll be joining us and the packs are actually on sale for this um, as of today. So you can get it now. Um, previews for the next outturn are next Thursday, the 25th. And the outturn uh, is currently scheduled for the 2nd of April. Um, one of the things that you might also want to try is, um, is our home dining experience. This, uh, this month's menu or th this part of March's menu is the Wild Garden um, and it features some of the best of Scotland's kitchen in the spring. Um, the best thing about that is you can order for national delivery um, at, or collect from venues in Glasgow and Edinburgh. So even if you're not near a venue, you can still, um, you can still enjoy it. Um, but most of all, it's, it's been a delight sharing these drams with you. Thank you to Les and John and David and our producer, Andrew, who's behind the scenes. Um, so I'll raise a glass to you and, and we'll see you next time. Slantra. Mm -hmm.